Okay, um, welcome to the second part of, uh, of my trip blog. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the, the technical things and, the, um, and the, the more nuts and bolts kinds of things that went on on the trip. Um, first of all, the bicycle. The bike is a Takara Prestige. I don't really know that much about the bike. Um, for the internet having as much information as it does, there's really not a lot about the Takara company. What I suspect is, is that the bike was probably made by some other company and Takara is just a rebrand. It's really kind of a bread and butter sort of bike. Um, very, very much kind of in the same vein as let's say a Schwinn World Sport would have been. Um, it's a 23 inch frame. Uh, loved steel, very nicely, actually very nicely done. Uh, it originally had a nutted front wheel, swaged double crank, and stem shifters. So that gives you an idea about what kind of bike it was. It was really the kind of bike that you would probably buy um, your kid for in high school or maybe when they were going away to college so they could uh, kind of zip around. Um, I don't really know how much it weighs Un unloaded, but I would guess about 32 pounds. So it's definitely not a light bike. And the reason that I bought it in 1987 was, is that at that time, I only had a Raleigh uh, three speeds, uh, Raleigh Sports. Um, I had bought a Trek 410 in 1983, actually from all my savings of working tech in summer stock, but the bike got stolen. Um, so this was kind of what I would call a fill-in bike that just kind of ended up sticking with me. Eventually I did buy a Trek 520, but I really ended up riding it. I don't know, somehow I always ended up riding the Takara. Also, um, I got a really good deal on this Takara. Uh, an acquaintance of mine in Binghamton, New York was starting a bike shop, and he gave me a pretty deep discount on it. So it helped both of us, uh, both of us out. Now, I know it's really easy to spend time online uh, drooling over great bikes, um, but the uh, relatively cheap uh, Takara Prestige worked just fine for this trip, and I really could have been happy riding almost anything, uh, despite all the glamour and romance the bike manufacturers try to push on us. Um, I gave little thought to the bike other than making sure that everything was maintained and running well. But strangely, I had no mechanical problems at all, not even a flat tire. Um, still, I'm probably not going to use it for touring again, and here is why. Okay, first of all, it's it's fairly heavy. It's a plain gauge alloy, uh, so it's a four, I guess like a 4020 or 4010 frame um, with high carbon steel forks and high carbon steel uh, stays, which makes it up for a fairly heavy construction. Also, even though the bike was converted from 27 inch wheels to 700C, it will only take 32 millimeter tires with fenders. So it's just barely accurate, uh, adequate uh, for riding on abandoned roads. Uh, it will not handle rough road shoulders very well. And once I actually, on the tour, I nearly wiped out uh, trying to sort of steer the bike back onto the macadam I kind of went into a skid and kind of almost almost uh, ran into traffic. So um, I think that that's a, that's a very strong reason. Also, um, I change, did change out the brakes. I put Tektro long reach brakes on it, uh, side pulls. And the bike does in fact brake pretty well um, when it's just, um, you know, just basically plane stripped down but with 30 pounds of gear on it uh, and if, if if we're in the rain luckily I did not ride in the rain at all during this trip except for a little bit on the way on the like very very last few blocks to my house um, I think that the braking would be really inadequate so um, I really think that for touring bikes especially ones that are even loaded with just 30 pounds of gear disc brakes are really the way to go. Um, the bike has a 126 millimeter, uh, fairly narrow, uh, wide rear axle and a six speed freewheel. And those are now really antiques. 
So if either of those goes kaplooey on the road, um, I've got a serious problem on my hands. So I want something that's maybe just a little bit more kind of current and up to date and standard and, you know, that any kind of, you know, bike shop would be able to, uh, to handle it. Also, um, Joe, as the bike is called, he, he was called, the bike's real name is Joe Takara, um, which is kind of a long story, but um, Joe, as the bike is named, has no uh, rack brazons for front or back, and a front back rack would really help, and a rear rack with lower rails would also have helped a lot. The center of gravity on the bike when it was loaded was fairly high and I really felt that if I you know I got up and I pushed out of the saddle the bike would kind of sway a bit and uh, so I would really like to go with some kind of system where the the rails the rails that actually hold the panniers are lower than the brake bolt. A uh, couple of things that I would just really like in a bike that the Takara doesn't have I would really like a steering lock that keeps the front wheel from flopping and tipping over when the bike is stationary. Uh, for this trip, I used an improvised luggage strap that I wrapped around the wheel to the frame, but I also ended up banging my shins a number of times when the uh, bike started to fall over, uh, when, especially when I would make like little impromptu stops to pull snacks out of the panniers. Also, a built-in generator and battery with a USB port to run a headlight and taillight as well as charge things like my phone and my little clip-on blinker lights would be a huge improvement. I'm also thinking um, that even though I really have kind of grown to love uh, drop bars, that a wide flat handlebar, maybe a multi-bar of some kind, would be somewhat better, um, allowing for easier reach when I'm touring, kind of a more upright style, and also uh, greater steering leverage. So here are the, some of the things that I did to the bike uh, before I, before I uh, took it out on the tour. I replaced the rear freewheel, which was a modern 28 tooth max, which you can still buy. You can still buy a Shimano 28 tooth six speed. Um, but I had a Suntour 34 that I had actually purchased back in the 90s as a spare, kind of suspecting that they would stop making them. And sure enough, they did. And uh, as a part, it's worth about $100 on eBay. It was in the original box and everything. But I didn't really want to sell it. And I didn't really want it to just kind of be sitting around, you know, as a, as a museum piece for someone to find when I die. So I put it on the bike. Also, I had a brand new mid-range 46 tooth uh, replacement mid-gear for the front for the front crank um, that I uh, that I also installed. And I had bought that in 1987 when I bought the original uh, crank uh, crank set. I bought a spare also because I was pretty sure I would wear the center gear out because that's what I ride in the most. Um, and I only ended up using it about 34 years later, but um, I've been carrying it around in my parts box ever since. Um, I added a brand new chain, and all of this really gave me a silk, really kind of nice silky smooth gear shifting, and it also uh, dropped the lowest gear I could shift into to 20 gear inches, and I will tell you that proved invaluable. Um, my legs, uh, at least at the beginning, were not that strong and I was climbing some pretty uh, steep hills. Um, also while I had everything apart, I did my best to get the chain rings on the front to run true. I didn't succeed very well. Uh, I moved the, you know, I, I did this conventional wisdom, I, you know, I moved the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the square taper of the axle uh, at various degrees to the crank to see if I could correct it. It seems like that probably the bottom bracket cups are slightly worn, which is causing the, uh, the axle to wobble a little bit. So the problem is not, is not in the connection between the uh, axle and the crank, but actually the axle itself. But uh, because of that, I ended up taking apart the whole bottom bracket again, which I had actually recently done. And I cleaned and re-greased everything and put that back together. I also cleaned a lot of little nooks and crannies along the way. I cleaned up the crank and so forth. Um, 
I also realized that one part of the bike that I had not recently serviced, in fact, I couldn't remember if I had ever serviced it, was the headset for the steering. So I took that apart, that apart as well, and I was amazed at how good everything looked after all these years of riding. I think I replaced the bearings. I had some caged, some new caged bearings that I put in. I also switched the old Brooks 72 B72 saddle because it was really about ready to die, and I put on a cell anatomical leather top H2 type saddle. Uh, this saddle is actually made for very heavy riders but I wanted a very uh, beefy saddle, especially in terms of the, the cage that holds it together. I've had a few Brook, I had at least one Brooks uh, saddle where the frame, actual, the frame actually snapped. And uh, I'm actually fine with stiffer, stiffer saddles. I, I almost never get saddle soreness, which is one nice thing. So the fact that it was kind of a little bit on the stiff side was okay. Um, I also changed the pedals to flat fixation brand fixation brand uh, mesas. Uh, I bought the all metal ones. I, I just felt better about having all metal rather than the plastic ones. And these have little nubs to keep your shoes aligned on the on the pedal uh, surface. Um, the bike originally had old rat trap style pedals with straps, which I love, but um, I only own one pair of 1980s vintage Avocet touring shoes which are getting pretty iffy and you can't really find anything quite equivalent to it. Also, I wanted to wear an all-purpose shoe that I could wear off bike and I wouldn't have to carry two pairs of, you know, an extra pair of shoes on the back of the bike. So, um, so I bought some um, Merrill, I think they're called Merrill Freewheel 2s and they worked great. Um, this decision was a good one because I often had to quickly stop and let vehicles go by so I didn't have to clip and unclip. I had also bought the fixation Velcro pedal straps to go with the pedals because I heard they were great, but I was immediately turned off by them. I thought they were ponderous and I did not want to use them, so I did not use them on the tour and I think I'm going to sell them. Um, so if anyone wants a nice pair of pedal straps, uh, let me know. Uh, before I embarked, I also checked the tightness of all the fasteners and I made sure that I had all the tools to tighten and adjust just about everything that the bike might that uh, might come loose or need adjustment on the bike. The only thing that I omitted and I knew I was omitting it was stuff for the crank. Uh, that's the realm of bike shops and I didn't want to have to carry all the crank tools. They're pretty heavy. Other things that I've added to the bike over the years uh, more recently, I added some 700C Sunringle CR18 rims with Origin 8 or genetic se generic sealed hubs. Um, when I first got the bike, I changed the stem to a Nitto Technomic, which is kind of a high neck stem, so it brings the handlebars up. And it's also shorter, it's 90 millimeters. Uh, most of my height, or at least my height distribution is such that a lot of my height is in my legs and my torso is fairly short. So I, I've, I have a little bit of trouble getting good bike fits. So I have to do some funky things with stems and, and, uh, and seat posts and so forth. But um, this worked okay. The tires were Schwalbe Marathon Tours. I absolutely love them. I think I want to have them on every bike I own. Uh, they roll pretty easily on pavement, they're great off-road, and you just don't get flats. And I think that's a really big selling point. <laughs> um, the rear derailleur also replaced, uh, I think the original was probably a Suntour, probably like a Suntour VX, but the new one is a Shimano Dior 9-speed that I'm using without the indexing. The crank is a Segino uh, GT Triple, it's a 52-46-28. The brakes are Tektro 559s. The levers are Tektro. Uh, the shifters are Suntour Barkhan type. Um, pretty old style, probably sometime in the 80s. They're non-index. And the fenders are Blumel's Club Special. Um, one other thing that I did was, is I also did a little experiment in solar electricity. On this trip, I tested out a Voltaic, um, Voltaic is the brand with a capital V, uh, solar charger 
that went on the back of my bike. It kind of folds open like a book, uh, along with a, the storage battery that comes with it, small, that I kept in my handlebar bag, and that accumulates uh, a charge no matter what the voltage is. So if there's not full sun and the voltage is a little bit low, it still charges. And it managed to keep my phone fully charged, and at night it also recharged my front and rear clip-on blinker lights, which is pretty amazing. Two of the three campsites that I visited, because I spent, th it was four days and three nights, two of the three campsites uh, had no electricity. On the third day, I think the bike just didn't get enough direct sun, so the battery just didn't charge up enough. I kept my phone charged, but didn't have enough charge in the battery to uh, recharge the, uh, the blinker lights overnight. Um, but luckily that campground had a site with an electrical hookup, so I just plugged in and charged. The fourth day too, which was about eight hours total, just didn't seem to have enough um, sunlight either to charge up the battery. However, I was able to keep my phone charged and it also allowed me to recharge on the fly my front light, which tends to go through juice faster than the rear. The rear on low will blink for about 10 hours, uh, but the front light will usually uh, conk out after about seven. Um, on, in addition to this, I also carried a large uh, Mophie power bank, which is made for a phone. It'll charge your iPhone about eight times. Um, and I kept that just as an emergency backup. Excuse me. Luckily, I didn't need it, but it was just nice to know that it was there in case, you know, everything just kind of, you know, fell to pieces. A few other pieces of gear that I use. My panniers are 1987 uh, Cannondale touring panniers. I love them, but they're very small, and they're also not made anymore. <laughs> so uh, probably going to go to something else. Uh, the shoes, as I mentioned, Merrill uh, Freewheel 2. They're a little funny looking. They kind of look a little bit like 70s earth shoes, but they're stiff enough for biking and sufficiently supple for walking around. I bought a, set, a pair of size 11s because that's what was recommended, but they're actually about a half size too big, so I just ordered a second pair of 10 and a halfs, uh, both to have the correct size and also as a hedge, because usually the stuff I like, they stop making it, which kind of, which will bring me to kind of the th the next the sort of the next thing after this. Um, the shirt uh, I was by Icebreaker uh, Marina Wool, highly recommend them. Uh, you can often get them on sale. They dry quickly, they don't smell, and they're pretty tough. Um, and also they're great when it's kind of hot, and they're also great when it's kind of warm. When it's hot, they kind of cool you down, and when it's, uh, when it's cold, they kind of keep you from getting chilled. So it's kind of a really nice combination. The shorts that I use are by Giro, and they're called like a Giro short liner. And they're just lightly padded, and they also have a fly, which is fantastic. Um, they're super comfortable, and I actually just wore them under a pair of old L and L Bean pant cutoffs. Um, uh, they were great, but the availability of them online seems to indicate that they're out of production. Uh, you can get certain sizes, but the mediums that I wear you can't find anywhere. Uh, REI seems to have something similar by another company, so I'm going to check those out. And uh, being that I'm not a YouTube I'm not a YouTuber. Uh, you'll probably just have to send me an email if you're curious. I'm not posting it on YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, the tent that I use was it called a Lynx One. Uh, it's a very inexpensive tent from Amazon. Uh, I think it's like $134, which is just ridiculously cheap. Um, but it got re good reviews and people said it was fairly durable and it seems to, seems to be the case. Um, I did buy a ground cloth to, to function basically as what they call a footprint, basically it's something to put under, under the tent to keep things like rocks and uh, sharp, sharp roots from damaging the bottom of the tent. And I did do that. I did carry that tarp and put it under the tent. Worked fine. Uh, the stove did not get a huge amount of, of use. Uh, but it was an MSR Pocket Rocket 2 that I purchased from REI in Concha Um Actually, nice trip from Philadelphia if you need stuff. 
uh, take a nice bike ride up to the REI in Conchac. It's pretty easy to get to actually. Um, it was great for making quick hot water uh, for coffee or soup and noodles. And it's also worked fine for making soft boiled eggs. So, um, you know, you get some, if you, if you end up uh, going through farm country, you might even just get some free eggs, which I did. And uh, you can make uh, some nice eggs um, that you can, if they're, you know, hard boiled or soft boiled, you can pretty much eat them anytime. Uh, the sleeping bag was a Co Kelty Cosmic 40. It's a down and polyester bag. Seemed to be fine. I, I have notes here. I'm a chilly willy and it was great. So it seemed, seemed to be fine. Of course, the, the weather was incredibly hot, but uh, by dawn, it started to get cool enough that I needed to crawl inside of it. Um, the sleeping pad was a Climate Static 5. Uh, super comfy, a little difficult to inflate, it's kind of a little hard to get the air out of, but otherwise work fine. My expenses, this is interesting, this is, I think this is kind of the Thoreau in me, is, wants to itemize all the expenses, but um, just to give you a kind of tentative breakdown, it was about $50 a day, my expenses for this. So if you call this a vacation, I, I'm not really sure that this was really a vacation, it was kind of more of a, kind of a, a soul experience, I guess you would say, morbid experience. Um, but the uh, campgrounds were about $103. Uh, food, snacks, uh, cold water. You know, I think at one point, I think in KOP, I stopped at the convenience store and just bought a gallon of cold water, you know, a gallon of spring water. Uh, it was about $20. And I didn't do much eating out, although I did occasion uh, on two occasions, um, yeah, on two occasions, actually, on the second day and on the fourth day, I kind of pigged out uh, at two very, very, very modest places. I think my eating out expenses were only about $25. That's, you can see that I'm eating at pretty, pretty inexpensive joints. I didn't eat at total greasy spoons, but um, pretty, pretty inexpensive. And that's, that's pretty much, that's pretty much the whole story. Um, on the on the bicycle, and I'd love to hear uh, anyone's anyone's feedback. And uh, thanks for listening.